A reading from the book of John, chapter 14, verses 27 through 31. Peace I live with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You heard me say, I am going away and I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not say much more to you, for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me, but he comes so that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now, let us leave. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So throughout this year, uh, we've been looking at the last teachings of Jesus to his disciples. Uh, And these are all coming before his death. And there's something of a gift to his disciples before he leads them to prepare them uh, for the road ahead. Now, Stories of old, uh, in ancient stories, uh, kings and knights and warriors and explorers were often given gifts before a long journey to protect them, uh, to provide safety for them, and to guide them along the way. And Jesus has already told them that at some point their paths will diverge. So these teachings are something of a gift to prepare them and to protect the disciples and to guard them for the journey ahead. And what he gives to them is not a sword. He doesn't give to them a shield or a bow or a belt. He gives them something that they will need for the road ahead. And in fact, it's something that we very much need today, and that is his peace. So this evening, we're going to consider his peace, and we'll consider three things. We'll consider that we need it, what it is like, and how we receive it. That we need it, what it's like, and then how we receive it. So first, that we need it. Disciples are in the upper room, and it's a place where Jesus has had a final meal with them. It's a place where he washed their feet and served them. And while there have been some unfortunate uh, sort of revelations and developments along the way, the fact that there was the prediction of the denial by Peter, the fact that there was the betrayal by Judas, in general, this place was a place of safety. It was a place of protection. It was a place of intimacy for the disciples. Chapter 14 is something of a final moment of relational connection in the upper room. And the disciples are afraid. Verse 27, we read this. It says, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Right after this, Jesus and the disciples, they would head out into the night to Gethsemane where the Roman officials and all the Jewish religious leaders were waiting for them because of Judas' betrayal of Jesus. They would face all of them in the night. It would lead to Jesus' arrest, his trial, and then his death. And in this context of fear, Jesus offers his peace. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Do not be afraid. Now, in general, when we think of peace, we think of a state of mind. We think of emotional well-being, calmness, or tranquility of heart. Or we typically think of peace as a a description of external circumstances, lack of conflict, or the cessation of all hostility. And yet the Bible's definition of peace is much richer and much more expansive. In the Old Testament, uh, the word for peace was the word shalom. And shalom meant wholeness, it meant flourishing, it meant fullness, it meant health in every area of life, socially, relationally, spiritually, physically. And what Jesus is saying is not just a pleasantry. It's not like saying hello or goodbye. What he's saying, and what he's also not doing, is he's also not simply wishing inner calm. I hope that you'll have a tranquil life, or I hope that you'll have smooth sailing throughout life, no conflict in your life. Jesus is not merely wishing for peace. He's, in fact, giving it. And he is bequeathing it and offering it to his followers. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. And with everything that brings you fear in the world, fear of what the authorities are going to do, 
Fear of the loss of reputation that's going to happen because you've been following me. Fear of losing physical safety and the possibility of your own life. Fear of losing anything and everything that you ever valued. I'm offering a peace that is an antidote to your fear. It's something you can have. It's something you can experience. and something I give to you. It's not just a wish for peace. It's the offer, a gift of peace. And it's the promise of whole whole and comprehensive flourishing in every area of life. That means no more sense of incompleteness. It means no more sense of the world falling apart without any hope. It means no sadness and no mourning over sickness and death. It means no more fear about being insignificant or being forgotten. It means all the anxiety and the hostility and the disappointments of the world. And amidst the fear, I am giving you my peace. Now, Luc Ferry is a French philosopher, and he essentially has said that all world religions at some point tried to address a very common human experience. And that is the co- a common fear that we have of what can be lost and never recovered. In other words, it's the fear of death that we share in common. And every world religion tries to address this. He writes this, he says, this is why all religions strive to promise us eternal life, to reassure us that one day we will be reunited with our loved ones, parents and children and friends, brothers and sisters, husbands and wives, children and grandchildren, from whom life on earth must eventually separate us. It's the fear of death. And let me say that that fear isn't merely that loved ones will die. It's the fear of losing anything that we value or anything that we deeply treasure or cherish. Let me give you some very specific, practical, concrete examples. The reason we experience fear when we're interviewing for a job or when we're auditioning for a new role or when we're asking someone out on a date is because, is, it's the reason why we have a fear is that we have a fear of the loss of reputation. We have the fear of the loss of some kind of approval that somehow you won't be as impressive in real life as you are on Facebook. Uh, or you won't be as impressive up close as you are uh, uh, from a distance. And the reason, for instance, we are often afraid of speaking the truth in challenging situations is because we are afraid of the professional and relational costs that we will have to bear if we speak the truth. It's a fear of the loss of comfort in the status quo. Or, for instance, the reason we are afraid of relational commitment, New Yorkers, uh, always browsing, never buying, not, not suggesting that any of you are here. This is for hypothetical New Yorkers. Uh, And I'm not just talking about committing to a gym membership. But the reason why we have this fear of commitment to relationships, to a fellowship group, to a church, it's the fear of the loss of control. And it's the fear that you are now bound to someone or someone now has a claim to you and you no longer have control and autonomy in your life. And the Bible recognizes that there are realities in the world that we are afraid of. And yet, amidst the fear, Jesus comes and he offers his peace. Now, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., uh, who was certainly not unfamiliar with situations that elicited fear, he once said this, Each of us faces circumstances in life that compel us to carry burdens of sorrow. Adversity assails us with hurricane force. Glowing sunrises are transformed into darkest nights. Our highest hopes are blasted and our noblest dreams are shattered. While admitting these weighty problems and staggering disappointments, Christianity affirms that God is able to give us the power to meet them. He is able to give us the inner equilibrium to stand tall amid the trials and burdens of life. He is able to provide inner peace amid outer storms. He offers neither material resources nor a magical formula that exempts us from suffering and persecution. But he brings an imperishable gift, peace, I leave with you. It's a peace that we need. So what it is like? What is it like? Well, it is three things. It is unfolding, it is personal, and it's costly. 
This is unfolding. What you see throughout the book of John is that the disciples are frequently described as being afraid. In fact, chapter 14 begins with the fear of the disciples and it ends with the fear of the disciples. It says that their hearts were troubled. And repeatedly, Jesus offers them peace. And what you see is that peace is not something that is immediately fully understood. Your awareness has to deepen of it. Uh, Your awareness grows and it unfolds and it expands. It's a little bit like a sunrise. A sunrise begins with a glimmer of light on the horizon. And yet what eventually happens is as the sun comes up, the dawn sky becomes brighter and brighter and brighter until everything becomes day. James Boyce was a pastor of 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia, uh, and he used to tell this particular story. He said, at the end of the Civil War, uh, there are federal soldiers who are traveling from Richmond, Virginia to Washington, D.C. And along the way, they come across a soldier. Uh, The soldier is worn out, the soldier is tired, the soldier is haggard uh, and hungry, wearing a Confederate uniform, uh, and he's hiding in the woods, and he comes out and he begs them for food. And so the soldiers say, well, why don't you go back to Richmond for food? That's where your army is. And the soldier explains, well, I can't go back because three weeks ago I deserted the army and I've been making my way north hoping to find safety. And if I am to return, to my, return back to Richmond, I would be shot. The federal captain says, well, haven't you heard the war ended two weeks ago? And what the soldier comes to realize is that there has been a peace for the last two weeks. And yet, because it has not dawned on him, and because he has not heard of it or experienced it, he has been on his own, starving, in the woods, deathly afraid he'd be captured and then killed because he didn't understand that there was peace. Because the soldier wasn't aware of this declaration of peace, he lived as if he were still at war. And in fact, this is very much the experience for us as Christians. If, you have, if you're a Christian, you've experienced this. You've heard that there is peace, and yet there are still pockets in which you still live, as pockets of your life where you still live in fear, as if you're still at war, on the run, in the woods, and hungry. And the easiest way to know the degree to which you understand the peace that Christ gives is to look at your fears. Are we in constant fear? Is there an unrest that we might lose control or comfort or success or reputation in our lives? Or is there this growing, deepening, unfolding, expanding experience of peace? Do you have it? But this peace is also very personal. What Jesus says is not just, I wish you peace. That's a wish for emotional well-being. And he doesn't merely say, I will make peace. That's a resolution to external conflict. He says, my peace I give you. When the disciples are afraid, Jesus doesn't so much as fix the problems, nor does he give emotional calm. He offers them his peace. Now, there's a place, John chapter 6, where the disciples are on, in a boat on a lake, It's dark out, and they're by themselves. And there's a storm that comes through. There's a wind that rolls up, and the waters begin to get rough. They're about three miles out from shore, uh, which means that because of the waves and because of the darkness, they could not see land. And Jesus comes to them in the storm, and he says to them, It is I. Don't be afraid. I'm here in the storm. My presence will drive out your fear. My presence will give you peace. And while we see in other parts of the Gospels that Jesus often will still the storms and he will calm the waves, in this particular story, he doesn't so much calm the turbulence of the waves, but he calms the turbulence of their hearts. And he does that through his presence by which he gives them true peace. Now, last year, in the New York Times, there was an article called, The World is Going Berserk, But Inner Peace is Still Possible. And the article basically described the fact, it was basically a study of the psychological impact of urban living, what it's like, the the way that city living changes our brains. 
and noted that anxiety rates in cities are typically much higher than anxiety rates outside of the city for people who live in the country. This may be a surprise to you, but it's in fact true. Science has proved it, that your anxiety is in fact proven, it's actually scientifically proven. Because there are issues that plague us like housing shortages or cost of living increases or status anxiety because we live so close to people or, for instance, pollution, city dwellers often live with a higher sense of anxiety. This explains, for instance, according to the, the, the writer, this explains our urban fascination with eating food that is grown on farms. That's why we are so into the locavore movement or we care about farm to table. It's the desire to connect with something that is less urban and therefore less anxiety ridden. For instance, this also describes our need for personal connection in spite of the anonymity of the city. According to the article, apparently there is, uh, as an alternative to the anonymity of ordering food online, there has been an app that's been de developed that allows you to connect to your neighbors who might want to cook for you. <laughs> and in deeply stressful, it's true, and in deeply stressful, anxiety-ridden situations, what we desire to dispel our fears is relationship. And we desire personal connection. This is what the writer says. Writes, on the face of things, ordering a plate of rigatoni from someone you don't initially know might seem to have little to do with disaster preparedness or coping with the uncertainties of a tumultuous world. But leaders who have dealt with acute crisis agree that those areas of a city that fare best are those neighborhoods where social connections are strongest. When something terrible happens, you need to be able to rely on those near you. It's saying that peace in the storm comes not just as a result of the storm passing, but it comes as a result of the personal presence and the relationships that you experience while you're in the storm. Do you know what Jesus says to his disciples when he sees them after the resurrection for the first time? The disciples had followed Jesus for three years. They had committed their lives to him. They had put all of their hopes in his mission and his plan. And yet at the end of his life, he was betrayed, he was uh, tried, he was killed in the most horrific way imaginable. They had invested their entire lives in him. And he had led this movement with the promise of a different kind of kingdom. And yet now he is gone. And when he appears to them, the disciples are gathered at night in a room with the doors locked. The reason was because they were afraid of the authorities outside. And do you know what the first thing that comes out of Jesus' mouth is when he comes to see them for the first time? Peace. Peace be with you. And even with your fears, the fear of the authorities, fears that my promises of a kingdom won't come true, or fears that I've abandoned you and forgotten you, I bring you my peace. And amidst all of that, my presence is your peace, and I'm here. It's personal, and it's costly. In this passage, there's a place where Jesus corrects his disciples for uh, their lack of love. Verse 28 says, you heard me say, I am going away. If you loved me, you would be glad that I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. If you understood where I'm going, going to the bosom of the Father, I'm going to be reunited with the Father. Uh, it's a place of glory. It's a place of heavenly home. If you truly loved me, you would rejoice and you'd be glad over me, even though it meant I'd be away from you. And he's essentially saying this, in a relationship of love, a relationship of love doesn't happen when the world revolves around your fulfillment and emotional well-being. True love is when you work for another's fulfillment or for their well-being. In fact, true love is finding your fulfillment in the fulfillment of another. It's when you invest your joy in the joy of another, when you invest your happiness in someone else's Happiness. That's true love. And it's only when that happens that you can actually experience true love. This is why, since we've been married, uh, Kyoko has watched every major and minor superhero movie that's been released in the last 12 years. X-Men, all the X-Men, 
uh, all the Wolverine spinoff movies, uh, you know, Avengers, Iron Man, this, even the Superman reboot, uh, Thor, Captain America, all the Batman movies and so on. She's investing her joy in my joy. <laughs> One of the days I remember in our marriage when I felt the most loved was the day that I returned from a trip and she came to the door and she said, while you're away by myself, I watched Ant-Man. <laughs> yeah, I've, never, I've said this, I, I just feel so loved. <laughs> this is also why last summer, I finally finished Jane Eyre after 12 years. Uh, and literally, it's not that she had mentioned to me 12 years and I held off for 11 years and six months. I had actually been reading it for 12 years and I finally finished it last year. <laughs> <clears throat> what Jesus is saying about his disciples' love is this. Your lack of love is because you are concerned with your well-being instead of mine. You're unhappy that I'm gone and that you miss me, even though I'm going to a far better place. And if you're in a true relationship of love, you will pour yourself into the joy of another. You'll be intimately invested in the joy and the well-being of another. That's how you understand true love. And it's the same thing for peace. If seeking the peace of God is merely for the fulfillment of your unmet preferences, if it's merely to give you emotional well-being or a more comfortable and a smooth life, I'll have peace when I get the job of my dreams. Or I'll have peace when I have the life that I want to live. Or when I have job security or the esteem of my peers. Once the job or the relationship or the reputation are threatened, do you know where you'll be? You'll be back in the storm. And it's essentially saying, I'll have peace, God, when you invest, in, you invest your peace in my peace. But if you say, my peace will be found in your peace, I'll find peace in your vision of peace. I'll take all my fears, all my anxieties, all the concerns I've had, and I'll, I'll find their resolution in your peace. If you do that, then you'll understand true, lasting, profound peace. And here's how we get it. It's very, very interesting that when the Bible talks about peace, it often talks about it in the same breath as conversations about kingdom and authority. So, for instance, John chapter 16 there is the triumphal entry. Jesus comes into Jerusalem and he's riding on a donkey to show his authority. And there's a quote from Zechariah that says this, do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming. Don't be afraid. The king that you wished for is here. And he is a king of peace. And he brings a reign of comprehensive, lasting peace. Isaiah Isaiah, for instance, talks about the coming of the Messiah as a prince of peace. Colossians chapter 3 says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Let it have some kind of authority and control over your life. Philippians chapter 4, the peace of Christ will guard your hearts. It will protect you. It will keep you safe. And what Jesus offers is the promise of a lasting, thorough, comprehensive peace. It's shalom. It's human flourishing. It's not just tranquility of heart. And it's not just a temporary resolution to conflict. It's the destruction of anything that would ever cause us to be afraid. No more alienation. There's no more sense of loneliness or abandonment. And there's no more sense that we don't matter or that we're irrelevant or that we are forgettable. Even death itself, the final enemy, will be destroyed and peace will reign over it. And when Jesus said these words, it was during a period of history called the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. And it was a 200-year span of peace in the Roman Empire that offered a taste of social, political, personal peace to all who were in the empire. And yet that peace, we know, was one that was achieved through empire and through conquest. It was achieved through power and the sword and through subjugation and through an exercise of imperial will and might to bring order to the empire. It was brought about by brutality and a sword. And it was a peace that was secured through destroying anyone who was at odds with this vision of peace. 
But the peace of Christ is utterly, utterly different. The peace of Christ comes not by power, but by sacrifice. And it comes not by a show of strength and might, but by service and by self-renouncing. And it doesn't so much come by someone who would hold up the sword. It comes through someone who would be pierced by the sword. And this particular peace, it's not one that is peace for some, fear for the rest. It's peace for anyone who has ever been afraid. It's through the defeat of the ultimate enemy that we are all afraid of, and that is death itself. It is a comprehensive, healing, lasting peace. And here's how it comes about. Jesus Christ on the cross confronts the one thing that can take away our peace, and that's the fear of death. And in fact, he doesn't simply experience the fear of death. He experiences death itself. And he does it to give us a peace that gets rid of all our fear. Jesus Christ experiences death to destroy the one thing that gives us mortal fear, and that's death itself. Look, on the cross, everything decays and unravels and dies. On the cross, Jesus Christ unravels emotionally. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? On the cross, he unravels. Everything begins to die socially. His disciples abandon him in his moment of greatest need. Everything dies politically for Jesus, the king of the Jews, and yet his people would not follow him. They utterly turned away from him. And in every area of life, the death and the fear of death will corrupt and tarnish and distort us socially, relationally, physically, spiritually. Jesus experiences that on the cross. Why? It's to give us the offer of true, lasting peace. And do you know where you begin to see that peace the most clearly in the Bible? It's right after his resurrection. Jesus leaves the upper room discourse with his disciples in John chapter 14, and he offers them peace. And then he comes back after the resurrection, and he offers them peace. And he says, here's how you can have peace. Remember that I defeated the greatest enemy, death itself. And I did it for you. I did it at the expense of my life. I've achieved lasting peace. And I did it through the giving and the cost of my life. I have come back to you. I've come back for you. To be with you. To go with you in the storm. And to promise you that because death is dead, you can have lasting peace. It's not just a peace that would last for a couple hundred years like the Roman peace but it's a peace that would never end. Death has been put to death, and it will never come back to life. And because I overcame death, I buried it, and I destroyed it. And now you can have peace. It will never rule over you again. And I did this for you. There's one last thing. It's fascinating what happens, what you see in this passage about what happens when the disciples begin to understand this peace. The passage begins with the disciples' fear. But it ends with Jesus' invitation to go out into the night with him. Come now, let us leave. In other words, when you have my peace, it gives you courage to go with me into the world and to show my peace to the world, even if it's dark even if you are afraid, even if there are storms, we can go out into the world and bring his peace to your relationships, to your workplace, to your neighborhoods, in all the connections you have in the city. You can be a living reminder that because of Jesus Christ, death is dead and his peace has come. Look, if you're afraid, go to Jesus. He'll give you his lasting peace. It's not a temporary solution. It's not a momentary sense of well-being that the world gives, but it is a permanent, 
lasting peace that comes at the cost of Jesus Christ himself, who buried death on the cross. Amidst your fears, go to him. He'll give you his peace. He is the Prince of Peace. Please pray with me. Our Father, we're thankful that you give us your peace, that your Son experienced all the horror and all the hardship of the cross to give us deep, lasting, comprehensive peace. Father, help us to experience that and help us to live in light of that. Father, we pray that you would remind us of that peace, that it would change us, it would transform us, and it would help us to follow you and to go out into the world bringing your peace. We thank you for what you've done for us in Jesus and for the peace that goes with us. We thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.